Hello and welcome to this episode of Life with Lizzie B, powered by the China Project. I am your host, Lizzie. Joining me today is Xifan Yang, China correspondent for Dicite. Uh, thank you so much, Xifan, for joining me today. Thank you, Lizzie, for inviting me. So, Xifan, China recently scaled back many of its pandemic controls and did so quite abruptly. What's the general sentiment as you observe on the ground among Chinese people? Are they supportive of the latest change? Are they suspicious? Or is it something in between? Um, I, th- I really do think it's a mix of relief, disbelief, and anxiety. So some people I've met over the last couple of days, they're really happy. You know, they can reopen their shops again. They can go to restaurants. They can. They're starting to plan. All, uh, they're, they're starting to planning uh, their first uh, trips abroad. And um, yeah, and some of the young people in China, they also do feel validated that uh, political protests can lead to something, right? <laughs> Others around me um, actually are really shocked, uh, especially when you are aware of the low vaccination rates among the elderly, when you are aware of the risk of getting long COVID. And uh, yeah, given all that, when you see the sudden shift in public messaging now, uh, which is actually a drastic shift overnight, um, then uh, yeah, just losing up like this feels a bit reckless. And I actually belong to that group. <laughs> and then uh, there's this third group, um, mostly elder people or just like regular folks you see on the street. They actually feel very anxious about all of this. They are very confused because um, they have been believing the zero COVID propaganda for three years. And um, the government has been telling them that Omicron is really dangerous up until just last week. And all of a sudden it's not dangerous anymore. So um, yeah, uh, those people, they feel insecure. They don't know how to protect themselves. Um, also, yeah, they, they, just, they just don't understand why they cannot also cannot get tested anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. So on social media, we've seen some chaotic scenes and people rushing to hospitals and local pharmacies to stock up on medicines and test kits. And I've heard from my family members that all the, uh, you know, cold remedies are sold out online. How hard or easy is it nowadays for people to get med supplies? Um, And how are people coping with the seeming shortage? Yeah, so um, I was just walking by some pharmacies this afternoon in Beijing, and you see that all the shelves with pain medicine, ibuprofen, and so on are are emptied out. Um, That's actually why we see all the long lines in front of the hospitals as well. It's not because all these people have heavy symptoms and need to go to the ICU. Um, No, it's like, uh, it's because the pharmacies um, don't have um, medicine anymore. They're sold out. So the only uh, place they, the people uh, still can go to are the hospitals. Um, But that in itself, uh, yeah, creates a new risk of people who maybe, you know, want to get um, medicine for their friends or um, their relatives and they go to overcrowded hospitals and there they get infected in the first place, yeah. Right. Um, so we've heard from many Chinese public health officials in the past few years who uh, cited China's low vaccination rate, especially among the older people, as well as the risk of overwhelming China's limited medical resources as the main reasons to stick to the zero COVID approach. Have these hurdles been cleared? If not, do you get the sense that China's pivot away from zero COVID is, is a little rushed? Um, yeah, I think it is very rushed. Um, we know that the vaccination rates among the elderly are low. Um, for the over 80 year old, uh, only 40% are boosted. And for, for the over 60 year old, the number stands around 70. I would even take those numbers with a bit of caution though, because if you want to look into how many people are um, vaccinated in various provinces, a lot of local numbers are not even available, right? For example, for um, remote provinces like Yunnan, Guizhou, Guangxi, or also Xinjiang, you don't find any data um, available in, in public. So. Yeah, um, that is not very assuring, I think. And um, I now the government wants to push the vaccination campaign as quickly as possible. Um, this weekend, when I was passing by some vaccination centers in Beijing, they were not operating at all. So, you know, why do you think Beijing made the sudden U-turn on zero COVID if the country is not prepared yet? 
Um, I think um, there were a lot of different reasons behind that. It's um, the economic costs that were exploding. A lot of provincial governments were going bankrupt mm -hmm. because they had to fund more and more PCR tests. They had to build all the fund sums for, you know, like billions of dollars. Um, then the pressure by big companies, uh, by big multinationals was growing when we remember the drama that we see, seen in Zhengzhou, right, uh, at the um, biggest um, iPhone factory in the world. Um, then, of course, um, I think the public discont discontent um, also had an impact. I wouldn't say it was a major trigger, but it had an impact, played a role. Uh, Beijing normally doesn't like to give in to protest, protest because they don't want to encourage more protests. Uh, but here, I do think the protests have been uh, giving the regime also a convenient off-ramp because now they say, see, you wanted to end zero COVID. Uh, here now, we now give you the end of zero COVID, right? And um, I also do think that um, the government came to the conclusion that 80% of the protesters only wanted to end zero COVID in the first place and not want to change the regime, which is why they thought it was safe to give in to that. And I also do think, I well, I, I also do wonder at least whether um, the recent trips abroad that uh, she uh, undertook played an impact. He has been to Bali, he has been to Bangkok, and um, maybe he had also uh, a change of mind when he was traveling abroad for the first time in three years. Right, and you know, to many of us in our international community who has been watching China's zero COVID lockdowns for the past few years, the news came as a pleasant surprise, but there are obviously potential risks. Um, based on your conversations with experts, what are some of the potential risks that we need to be aware uh, associated with China's COVID reversal? Um, I think the first obvious risk is the uh, exit, not even an, an exit wave, it's the exit tsunami <laughs> that's um, unavoidably going to happen over the next couple of weeks. And um, yeah, around a million, maybe even more people, especially the elderly, uh, the people with preconditions might die. So um, yeah, that, that is first obvious risk. Um, then I also do think that there might be a political fallout. Um, it's kind of, yeah, this drastic shift in public messaging is also kind of dangerous. You know, like for three years, you say COVID needs to be contained uh, at any price. And now you just lie flat and you just say, yeah, we don't care anymore. So I, I wonder whether uh, people um, will question uh, the government narratives, not only in this in, uh, instance, but also um, with other issues in the future. And then also there might be a political fallout for Xi himself, because he was portraying himself as a great townsman who was in charge of commanding zero COVID, steering China through this pandemic, right? And um, Xi himself is supposed to be infallible. So if... Um, his policies can change overnight, then uh, that doesn't really present the zero COVID exactly in a positive light, right? And that same, uh, the same goes for his personal judgment, maybe.